I welcome everyone and thank you for joining us uh, this evening in our last of our series for this semester about what do the cast for social studies look like in practice. Uh, my name is Lauren Glickio and I'm thrilled to welcome you here this evening to engage with us in this webinar that is designed to deepen your social studies content knowledge and pedagogy. Our topic tonight is kindergarten economics and we'll be joined with by representatives um, and with representatives from the St. Louis Fed. And just as a reminder, throughout this webinar series, you know, this is really a um, opportunity for you to engage with our content area experts who join us, our partners with us throughout these webinar series. So we do ask um, that you fully engage mm -hmm. in the webinar, that you have your uh, camera on when all possible, um, that you can uh, unmute and you know, verbally contribute or you also use the chat for uh, this evening's webinar. So our webinar goals for this evening is first we have our learning goal. So our learning goal is to support your implementation of the CAS for Social Studies through experiencing a grade level example. Our success criteria are I can analyze KEST1 to understand what this standard requires students to know and be able to do. Next, our other success criteria is I can improve my content knowledge and pedagogical skills after exploring a grade level sample. So as we do with every time we start this webinar series, we always anchor ourselves in understanding and revisiting the definition of a standard. So standards define what students should know, understand, and be able to do at the end of their grade level. So the CAS for Social Studies not only requires that students have this content knowledge that they uh, gain as they investigate the four disciplinary strands of civics, economics, geography, and history, as they're investigating that also using the inquiry practices, but we really want students to be able to do something with what they have learned. So every senior that we look at and we engage with in social studies education really requires that you know, students in some sort of capacity, um, you know, it, they outline what students should know, understand, and be able to do at the end of the grade level. When we first sit down with the standard, it's really important to understand the coding. So what the standard is actually about. So if you look at the example here, the standard we're going to look at tonight is KEST1. And the sentence for that standard says, demonstrate ways trade can be used to obtain goods and services. So if you look at the K, the first part of the coding, that refers to the grade level. So we're going to be looking at a kindergarten standard. The next letter is E, which represents economics. And that's our discipline strand. The next two letters are ST. And if you look over here on the right of your screen, you see the concepts and practices of economics. So ST refers to specialization, trade, and interdependence. So disciplinary concepts are the broad ideas that enable a student to understand the language of each discipline and are designed to remain with the students long after they are transition ready. The disciplinary practices refer to the skills students are expected to learn and apply when engaging with the disciplinary concepts. So students throughout their entire social studies education will be engaging with the concept and practice of specialization, trade, and interdependence. And we get a very solid foundation of that with this kindergarten standard as soon as students start their social studies education. So when we break down a standard, when we unpack it, we're really taking the standard and breaking it down into smaller, more explicit chunks for the purposes of curriculum development and or unit and lesson planning. So we've looked at the coding and we understand what the, like basically what the categories are that are involved with the standard. Next, we really need to look at what the actual sentence says. So it says demonstrate ways trade can be used to obtain goods and services. So first we look at the verb and we say, okay, well, what does demonstrate mean in the standard? Does it mean just to make meaning of? Does it mean to transfer? Are they applying what they know about trade in some sort of way? Does it mean to accurately state or does it mean to support ideas with details and examples? And what does the verb demand in terms of student learning? So as I was going through these questions, one of the things that I highlighted was not only the verb, but the content in the standard. What is that verb demanding of students to know and be able to do with the rest of the disciplinary ideas that are found in the standard? And in just a little bit, my colleague Heather will walk you through that with our tool to unpack standards. So it's not just so much about the verb, but it also includes the other content and skills, those disciplinary concepts and practices that are also involved in the sentence itself. 
So when you are unpacking or breaking down a standard, we really recommend that you do that with your PLCs, and we ask that you ask these questions when you're working with your colleagues. So what knowledge will students need to demonstrate the intended learning? So we talked about trade, that sentence had goods, goods and services. You know, is that the knowledge that students need to really understand to demonstrate mastery of the standard? What understandings will they need to master? So how does demonstrate interact with trade and goods and services in that sentence? What skills will they need to apply to demonstrate mastery? And how might students demonstrate the requisite skills through learning experiences? So we once we understand what the standard means, what lesson plan, what learning experience are we going to have students engage with that requires that students actually show that they understand the concepts and skills required of those standards. So next I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Heather, who's going to take this standard and use the tool to unpack standards to help us break it down in order to support us in our grade level example. Okay, so this is our tool to unpack standards. You can find it on kystandards.org, and we're going to look at these first four columns today to unpack our standard. So the first step is you will copy your standard over into the left side. We're going to really use the words in that standard to break it down and determine what the demands are. The second step is what knowledge, concepts, and vocabulary do students need to know to reach the standard? And so here, looking at that standard, you can pull out some of those keywords that really represent some vocabulary and some important concepts that kids are going to need to be able to demonstrate an understanding of to really show mastery of the standard. And so some of the what things here that students should learn, they're going to need to learn about trade, goods and services, and then the relationship also between goods and services. So the disciplinary clarifications, these are available for all of the standards K through eight and high school in the standards document. And so these are a starting point. They provide a little more information about the standard just to provide a little bit more context and get you started thinking about, you know, ways that students might be able to learn more about the standard. And so here, the disciplinary clarification for this standard is sometimes a community does not have the resources or skills to produce all the goods and services needed. Therefore, they may trade a good or service they do have to another place in order to receive from that place a good or service that they don't have. So taking that information, we can add a little bit onto that column. And so we can also add resources and skills, needs, and then trading for things you need and uh, that you don't already have. So the skill here is demonstrate, which Lauren has already talked about a little bit. And so this is a step above identifying. So students aren't just naming something, they're kind of going a little bit further than that, right? And so the level of proficiency here is going to be a two. And that'll go in that last column. Thank you, Heather. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to transition our evening to our colleagues from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and they are here to join you this evening to walk you through a grade level sample and example of what uh, kindergarten economics can look like. And I'll let them introduce themselves to you. And um, thank you, Amanda and Mary Claire. We're so grateful for you all to join us this evening. Thank you so much. Um, we are very excited to be here as well. So um, I would like to quickly introduce us. My name is Mary Claire Peet. I'm a, C a senior economic education spe specialist at the St. Louis Fed. Um, and my colleague, Amanda Geiger, as well, is a senior economic specialist um, at the St. Louis Fed. So really quickly, if you could in the chat, introduce yourself, what grade you teach um, and where would be great just so we can get a feel for what you're teaching. Next slide, please. And just a quick disclaimer, the views expressed in this presentation are our own and do not reflect official positions of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or the Federal Reserve System. This applies to myself and Amanda. And really quickly, I'm waiting for some, some chat, seeing some typing. 
I would like to see where you teach perfect kindergarten and where you teach would be great. If you're all kindergarten teachers, that's wonderful, but we just wanted to see if there was a range. And um, as discussed, wonderful, great. So as discussed, we're going to be breaking down the standard, demonstrate ways trade can be used to obtain goods and services. And with that, wonderful. Good to see everybody. That next slide. And the way we like to do this, um, you know, the title of our presentation is called Sneakonomics. And what we like to do is we like to sneak economics into the curriculum. So I'm pretty sure all of you have used a story to teach something, okay? Literacy at a minimum, but all sorts of other things. And what we've done is we've sort of woven, we found books that naturally have economics and then use that to teach economic standards. So that is what we're gonna be doing today, but we've done this for a lot of other ones as well. Um, you're doing this already. And so it's extremely easy for you to do this. It's just, instead of choosing this book, you're choosing that book. Um, and then we've already done all the work um, of the lesson plan, et cetera, to get you there. <laughs> I like that. I like to sleep, sneak my Amazon purchases in. <laughs> Excellent. And so our essential question for today is why is trade helpful? So you'll see and be able to connect that to demonstrate ways, um, you know, trade can, can help, uh, help with goods and services. So I, with that, I will let Amanda take over. Thanks, Mary Claire. Um, so since we have a range, this seems like a lot of you are kindergarten teachers, but a lot of you are actually um, secondary teachers, which uh, I was a secondary teacher for 12 years, and I used a lot of elementary uh, tools <laughs> because, to be honest, you're never too old for some things, including a good story. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today is our essential question is, why is trade helpful, right? So to start us off, you can in the chat, or if you want to be brave and come off mute, have you ever made a trade? So not necessarily with money or a purchase, right? But have you actually made a trade before? And if you're willing to tell us about it, you can do it in the chat or you're willing to come off mute either one. I was thinking about this question and it's, my brother was a master at it. My younger brother, who is, you know, a grown man in his 30s now, but is always a baby in my mind. He was very good at it. I can't remember what he left the house with, but I remember he came home with an old yellow Game Boy. And I was like, what is this and what is happening? Because I know you certainly didn't leave. <laughs> you didn't leave the house with that. Okay, I'm okay trading baseball cards. Yeah. Gift giving, Maggie, that's a good example. Gift giving is sometimes like a, a trade, right? You're bartering a little bit. Um, yeah, our children can be masters at it. I was trying to think about it. I think it gets a little bit more informal as we get older, right? Like, so I carpool and I kind of trade because they drive and like the, you know, there's some trade exchange. Um, I provide occasional uh, child care for their date night. So she drives the carpool and then I occasionally watch her kids so they her and her spouse can go on a date. So I which I feel like is a great trade <laughs> for me. Right. OK, but this idea of trading is that you're going to kind of. Switch one item for another. Right. And so why do we trade? What would, what's the purpose of trading baseball cards or carpool for child care? Like what uh, leads to that? Why are we why are we trading with each other? Yeah. Yeah, to get something that we don't have, right? So, and we could not have it because we just don't have access to it. Um, we could have it if we, maybe we need more of something. I like the idea of lightening the workload too. That's a good way of thinking about it, right? So this idea of why do we trade with each other? It's probably because, you know, in a kindergarten especially, there's usually a story with the answer, right? Like, well, I traded you know, so-and-so a pencil because they had one and mine had broken and, you know, but you'll get them there, but that's just to get them started. So we're going to kind of hold on to that question in our minds about why is trade helpful and like, why might we trade? And we're going to jump into this book. So this book is called One Fine Day. <clears throat> we're going to um, 
there are read along videos on YouTube of any of the books that you find lessons for on our website. We tried to make sure one that they're in print and then two that they're even if you didn't have access to the book, there were ways for you to access the story. Right. So I'm going to pull this up and like just for you in your mind as the teacher here. Right. We're by the end of the time we've read through the story and then worked through the activities that go with it. Your students should be able to tell you what bartering is. Right. So bartering is trading item for item. Purchase maybe like a purchase where you're trading money for an item. They're going to be able to figure out what makes barter unique. Like why do we use the term barter specifically? And then explain what are some of the there are two problems specifically with bartering as a form of trade, right? So through the story, they're going to kind of explore that and put a label on it because they'll be able to connect that back to that essential question. So trade is helpful in part because it helps us access things we want, but you're laying the groundwork as you move later into your standards that there are some types of trade that are more efficient. And then you start to put them into what's more close to what they experienced, right? Like the idea that we use money as a medium of exchange. So you're taking them kind of all the way back to the beginning of item for item trading and walking through why that's different than what they might have seen their parents do at the grocery store, right? Okay, so I'm going to, uh, and thank you, Mary Claire dropped a copy of this lesson into the chat. If you want to pull it up, you are welcome to follow along with us there or just save it for later. But we're going to watch and we sped it up a little bit because obviously this is at a speed for littles. So we made it just a little bit faster <laughs> for us grownups. But I'm going to um, stop talking and let us just enjoy the it's actually very beautifully illustrated. We're going to enjoy the illustrations and the story. And again, remembering thinking in your mind about what it, who's bartering and why are they bartering? Right. Why are they trading? All right. Here we go. And if somebody could give me a thumbs up when it gets going to make sure the audio is coming through. Readers, today we're going to read Thank you. One Fine Day. One fine day, a fox traveled through a great forest. When he reached the other side, he was very thirsty. He saw a pail of milk that an old woman had set down while she gathered wood for her fire. Before she noticed the fox, he had lapped up most of the milk. The woman became so angry that she grabbed her knife and chopped off his tail, and the fox began to cry. Please, old woman, give me back my tail. Sew it in place, or all my friends will laugh at me. Give me back my milk, she said, and I'll give you back your tail. So the fox dried his tears and went to find a cow. Dear cow, he begged, please give me some milk so I can give it to the old woman so she will sew my tail in place. The cow replied, I'll give you some milk if you bring me some grass. The fox called to the field. Oh, beautiful field, give me some grass. I'll take it to the cow and she'll give me some milk. Then I'll take the milk to the old woman so she will sew my tail in place and I can return to my friends. The field called back, bring me some water. The fox ran to the stream and begged for some water. The stream answered, bring me a jug. The fox found a fair maiden. Sweet maiden, he said, please give me your jug so I can fetch some water to give the field to get some grass to feed the cow, to get some milk to give the old woman to sew my tail in place so I can return to my friends. The maiden smiled. If you find a blue bead for me, she said, I will give you my jug. So the fox found a peddler and said, there is a pretty maiden down the road. And if you give me one blue bead for her, she'll be pleased with you and pleased with me. Then she'll give me her jug so I can fetch some water to give the field, to get some grass, to feed the cow, to get some milk, to give the old woman to sew my tail in place. But the peddler was not taken in by the promise of a pretty smile or the cleverness of the fox. And he replied, pay me an egg 
and I'll give you a bead. The fox went off and found a hen. Hen, dear hen, please give me an egg to give to the peddler in payment for the bead, to get the jug, to fetch the water, to give the field, to get some grass, to feed the cow, to get the milk, that I must give the old woman in return for my tail. The hen clucked. I'll trade you an egg for some grain. The fox was getting desperate. When he found the miller, he began to cry. Oh, kind miller, please give me a little grain. I have to trade it for the egg to pay the peddler to get the blue bead to give the maiden in return for her jug to fetch the water to give the field to get the grass to feed the cow to get the milk to give the old woman so she'll sew my tail in place or all my friends will laugh at me. The miller was a good man and felt sorry for the fox. So he gave him the grain to give to the hen to get the egg to pay the peddler to get the bead. To give to the maiden to get the jug, to fetch the water, to give the field, to get the grass, to feed the cow, to get the milk, to give the old woman to get his tail back. The fox returned to the old woman and gave her the milk. Then she carefully sewed his tail in place. And off he ran to join his friends on the other side of the forest. The end. Okay. So let's break it down a little bit in that story before we kind of go back directly to the barter. So what's the fox's problem or what problems does the fox have? You can come off of mute or you can tell me in the chat. What's the fox's problem in the story? He's thirsty. He is thirsty, yes. Yeah? So, and that begins all of his troubles, right? So because he's thirsty, he drinks some milk that doesn't belong to him, loses his tail, and then he's embarrassed about not having a tail, right? So your kids will give you a lot of different answers, but that's the crux of it, right? It all started because he drank some milk that wasn't his because he was thirsty. And then we lead us into our, into our tail. So does the fox get his tail back? At the end yes. of the story. Yeah, right? He does. He's going to barter for it. But did he get his tail back quickly? No. no, he didn't. And was it easy for him to get his tail back? No. No, it wasn't, right? He it, he kind of went on a real journey with it. So the next thing you do after you read through the story and just kind of debrief it with your kindergartners is there is a worksheet in this lesson. And Mary Claire is going to put in the chat for you. We have a Google slide version of this that you can actually edit along with us. So when you put it in there, uh, when she puts the link in, you can open it up and it'll prompt you to make your own copy so that you can edit without uh, interfering with anybody else, right? So she's putting that in the chat for you now. There you go. And so this is the worksheet that's already available in the lesson that you can just print and make copies of with your student. So what we're going to do is Mary Claire is going to take over our screen share and we're going to do this worksheet together and you can also do it on your own with that Google sheet, right? So this is what the worksheet looks like. You'll notice that it's visually cueing the students for the different parts of the story and you don't have to read the whole book again. You can start on page 21 which is, is pretty close to the end. This is where he actually starts to make the trade, right? So I'm gonna read you this part of the story again, and Mary Claire is gonna fill it in and you can fill it along on yours as well, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna track this trading as we go through. So it says, the miller was a good man and felt sorry for the fox. So he gave him the grain to give to the hen to get the egg, to pay the peddler to get the bead, to give the maiden, to get the jug, and I'm gonna pause here because I'm going way faster, right? To get the jug, to fetch the water, to give the field, to get the grass, to feed the cow, yep, grass to feed the cow, to get the milk, to give to the old woman, to get his tail back. The fox returned to the old woman and gave her the milk. Then she carefully sewed his tail in place and off he ran to join his friends on the other side of the forest. 
Okay, now with your kindergartners, you're thinking, man, our kindergartners do not spell spell that good. That's that is okay, right? There's a couple of ways you can do that. You can have them trace along as you go through the story again, right? Or you can have them write it in, depending on how much time you want to take with them on this. But what you're doing is you're making them to really look at the relationship and the item for item that's traded between the people, right? We're emphasizing that complexity to get his tail back and the amount of time that it took, right? Okay. So um, what is the fox going to do? Um, I guess let me back that up a little bit. How do you know? Um, let me think about how to ask that to a kindergartner. Let me back that up a little bit. So as you're going through this, how does the fox actually end up finding the, like getting his tail back, right? So he, he starts to barter. But then how does he know which items people want to get the milk? The milk is what he wants. So how does he know where to get the milk? They tell him. Yeah, they tell him. He has to ask a lot of people, right? So then he kind of, it takes him on this path. And it's a little bit if you give a mouse a cookie. He starts and says, okay, cow, will you please give me the milk? He starts with the item he wants, but then he doesn't have what the cow wants. So then he has to go find what the cow wants. But then he doesn't have what the field wants. So then he has to go find what the field wants. And then he has to work his way backwards in our story until he actually ends up with the milk. Then he can then take back through that story. He's also really dependent on the miller in this story because the miller actually kind of starts our trade train by giving him the grain so that he can then get the egg from the chicken to get the bead to get the jug, to get the water, to give the grass, to give the cow, to give the milk back to the old woman, right? So walking your students through that length of time. Okay, so then let me take us back to our slideshow. Um, the two big problems. What's one of the problems with bartering for trade? that our story highlights for us? Time. Time, right? So that initial question I asked right after the first time we read through the story, what makes, uh, was the fox able to get his tail back quickly? The answer is no, he wasn't, right? It took a lot of time. What's his other problem? Was it easy to get it back? No. It's not. Now, let me pause here in our kindergarten element and ask you, the grown-ups, why don't we barter for things? This is my grown-up question, because you and I have not bartered very much. If I want something, I go out and I use cash to purchase it. Why do we do that instead of bartering? I think there's sometimes a willingness obstacle, but there's also an ability obstacle. So in the story, everyone was willing to trade for something and everyone had the ability to trade for something. So during a drought, the stream might not have been able to give water. So it might not have been able to barter. Um, or in some situations, people might not be willing to share what they have. Um, mm -hmm. They might not feel like they have extra or feel like they just might not want to share. Mm -hmm. There is, so in economics, the term they call, they use the phrase a double coincidence of wants, right? Not only do you have to be willing to trade, you actually also have to have the item to trade that somebody else wants, right? And with barter, you have that to happen twice, like double coincidence. The person I want to trade with has to also want what I have in a quantity that we're willing and able to give, right? I like your thing that ability too, right? Willing and able to give. So if you're doing that for barter, that's very time consuming money as a like medium of exchange is much more efficient because you trade for money and that speed it streamlines that process right so that's our grown-up answer and eventually you know that's where you're going to get them you're going to get them to like well the reason we use money is because it simplifies this bartering process but before they understand this idea that money is a simplifier in trade they need to understand that to trade you have to have something that somebody else wants 
and trade for it, right? So our story highlights two key problems with barter that you'll build on later when you start to talk to them about why do we trade using money as a medium of exchange, right? Which is a vocab term for much later. Barter's very time consuming, okay? The Fox, if the Fox had just had money, this this whole story would have been over like, you know, in significantly fewer pages. But because he doesn't, he has to go item for item and collect the, collect the things that the next person he needs to trade with wants, right? And that takes a lot of time and leads to that second question is you have to find somebody who's willing to barter with you, right? Each person, an animal, the first half of the book is people telling them what they're willing to trade for. And the second half of the book is how he went and got that to then come back and actually barter with them. Right. So back in our essential question, why is trade helpful? Trade helps us access things that we may not have. Right. Or may not have access to. So it helps us to get more things than what we already have or fill wants that we can't with what we currently have. Right. But just because trading is helpful does not mean that trading is easy. Right. And there are not ways that you can make trading easier or harder. In, in terms of how you approach it, right? Okay, so this is the point where then you go, so we've read our story, we've kind of debriefed our story, we've identified two problems with bartering, right? Trade is still helpful. The fox got his tail back through trade, right? But there were ways in which that was harder than it, it had to be. So then in the next part of the lesson, your students are gonna do a hands-on activity to really illustrate and kind of create that scenario so they can experience that hardship for themselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Claire to kind of talk you through how that would look. Mary, oh, you're muted, Mary Claire. It always happens, man. How, do, <laughs> as, as, how many years? So um, before I start this, I just want to make one um, point to to sort of come back to that overarching standard of demonstrate ways trade can be used to obtain goods and services. And um, just one little tiny point here that most of the time when you're going to teach this, you're just going to focus on goods all the day, every day, and you forget about those services. And hidden in the, the Fox story is a service the woman sewed the tail back on. That is a service. Um, and so it's just a good thing to highlight because um, it's actually a, a, a huge deficit in all of our, um, in most economics curriculum that we just default to, to focus in on goods when in fact, the United States, 70% of GDP today is services, not goods. We are a services economy and most modern economies are services driven. Um, and we're still just adapting to that new world and talking about it in different ways. So I just wanted to, you know, just um, point that out. So if you end up using this to teach that standard, that's a little helpful tip. Um, so yes, so then we end up going into this fun activity which for your students, we say, hey, you are going to be making this puzzle. And the point of the puzzle will be to color it and actually put it together. So there are two sort of goals there. Um, and to do that, you're gonna break your t your group, um, your, your students up into groups of eight. So eight groups, all right? Not groups of eight, eight groups total, okay? And then um, with the next slide, we can see what we give them. So you're gonna give every group just a piece of cardboard for you for them to put that puzzle on and a glue stick, but then you give an envelope and the envelopes, you know, uh, the first group is just going to get eight pieces of the exact same puzzle, right? The second group is gonna get another eight pieces of the exact same puzzle. One group is just gonna get eight blue crayons and so on and so forth, right? And so then they're going to realize they don't have enough um, materials to actually complete the project, they are going to have to barter and trade with the other groups. So you're going to actually walk them through and say, hey, in order to complete this task, the task is you got to color, you know, the fox in orange and you've got to color the, you know, et cetera, in blue. Um, and so in order for you to be able to complete this task, you got to get the puzzles and you've got to get the different colors. So they will go around and do that um, and barter for these goods. 
no services in this one. <laughs> so then you'll see this final product, um, but the students should be able to take away, have a few takeaways because now they get the lived experience right, of demonstrating ways trade can be used to obtain goods, not services, but they're actually they're actually feeling it. It's through barter, but that is a type of trade. Mm -hmm. And so again, in the chat or, uh, you know, if you are brave and unmuting. Uh, so what problem did each group have? Missing three pieces. Yes, they were missing pieces and they were missing uh, crayons and they were missing a bunch of different things. Exactly right. They didn't have the requisite materials to actually finish the task. Mm -hmm. What did members of each group have to do to get those materials? Ta -da! They have to barter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Everybody knew that answer. You know All it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next question. All right, so then you're asking students, you know, hey, how was that experience? Were you able to get all the materials quickly? You, I'm sure that one kid is going to be difficult in the group. You know this. This is going to happen. Somebody's going to be difficult. Um, but yes, regardless, it's going to take a long time for a bunch of kindergartners, <laughs> kindergartners to uh, get all the materials they need. <laughs> And again, you know, you're breaking it down for your students. So was it easy for you to get those materials, right? Uh, so again, you can decide what questions and how to do it. Are you just in front of the class and having kids yell the answers? <laughs> and this is the question that sort of leads into, you know, what could have made it easier or faster for you to get what you needed to complete the puzzle? And whether or not students can get at, I mean, you, you don't necessarily want them to get to money because you you're not here to uh, have them <laughs> take, uh, you know, actually spend money on their classroom materials, but can they brainstorm ways that they could have made it faster? Mm -hmm. They might even end up telling you something as simple as if we had been more organized, right? Because yes. the, the chaos of the kindergarten, they'll realize <laughs> very quickly that they don't have all the pieces they need, but then they're going to have to track down through your seven other groups in the room who right. has the pe the fine and especially as you get to those final pieces, the kindergarten mind is probably not keeping a pattern of who I've already talked to. Exactly. They're interested in who <laughs> who has a question. And to be fair, because of how they approach it, some may finish with their orange crayon faster, and so you get an orange crayon from the same group that you got somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. That barring. So they're you know some of their examples they might come up with may just lend more to being more organized about it. Like, well, maybe we could have taken turns and said what we had and shared it with everybody who didn't have that, right? But yeah, just or, thinking or about there them, are ways to make it better. <laughs> right, exactly. Or put everything on a table, you know, and you take it or whatever. Right, so how can you organize it? Great, thanks, Amanda. Yeah. And finally, um, this is sort of my favorite part of any lesson plan, um, which is transfer. And transfer, um, you know, everybody uses different terminology here, but you're all doing it naturally, which is the idea of whatever concept you're actually, um, students are gaining mastery over, so critical for them to be able to transfer that idea to a new application. So it can be near transfer or far transfer, but that is the game. That is the game. You you win the game if you can transfer the idea to another scenario. Um, if, you know, uh, you will inherit the earth if you can transfer. I promise. It, there's lots of research that shows basically that's what when you get into the working world is you're not actually regurgitating an exact example of anything. You're taking a concept that you learned and you're trying to apply it in a new situation. And so. It's so critical and important to start early with this idea of transfer. And we are notoriously terrible at it. We can be told specifically, we're going to transfer now, <laughs> we're going to do this, and people are still really bad at it. So, you know, it's just so wonderful if you can start this process early with your students um, in kindergarten, and then they just get it every year from there out. Awesome. 
Yeah, I just want to point out too, before we show you our transfer activity, so all of our lesson plans, they start with a preparation section, right? So we tell you, here's what you need to do. So we would have already told you to prep those envelopes. You wouldn't be surprised by it as you read through the lesson. But then at the end, there's this assessment, this transfer piece, this component, right? But Maggie in the chat actually brought up a really great example that a lot of cafeterias do at schools. There'll be an unwanted items table. So like instead <laughs> of throwing it away, you can place it on that table. And so that might be a good idea when you're talking about students. Like it's not a direct barter, but there is a barter element there, right? Yeah. That like you didn't want this, so you put it here. You're trading it. Maybe you go swap out a flavor of your chip bag or something like that like I love that idea of like looking at their their environment that they're in and either kind of gently directing them towards those transfer examples that near transfer or bringing them up to help them like really illustrate the concept right but and I would say too one of the things we hope you take away from our lessons is this emphasis on vocabulary particularly with really young learners a lot of their instruction is vocabulary driven because you're just helping them learn how to label their lived experience, right? And so the more you use this economic vocabulary, like barter, like trade, goods and services, labeling things, that make it much easier for you down the line when you start looping into more complex concepts and more complex um, standards, right? So yeah, this, the, that specific vocabulary is super critical. And the more you integrate it, the easier it's gonna be for you you know, just period, right? It's just going to be easier for you all around. And they're just little sponges for vocabulary, um, particularly at this age. Um, okay, so for our transfer activity, we actually have another story that you <laughs> could give them. You could do this on the same day. You could break this up to the next day. That's kind of your choice. But we took, it's the same approach, right? We took a story that's going to highlight a barter scenario. And then we use the, the pedagogy technique, text to text, text to self, text to world, which again, pedagogy often, it has a lot of different names, right? But it's this idea of like directly finding things in the text and then kind of thinking and reflecting on how does that connect to your background knowledge, to other things that you know, and then how do you apply that in what you're seeing, okay? So we are, with the time that we have, I'm gonna just read you this story quickly, and then we're gonna jump a little bit more to the text to self, text to world, because you guys are all very savvy learners and we are not in <laughs> kindergarten, so you don't necessarily need to do the text to text answers, right? And again, if you with your students don't want to do this as a reading exercise, you can just read this to them and talk through the questions. It doesn't have to be formal, but if you want to do it more like a worksheet, you can, right? Okay, so it's a salty snack for Penny. Mm -hmm. At lunch, Penny opened her lunchbox. She had a ham sandwich, apple, and carrots. She wasn't in the mood for carrots today. She was in the mood for something salty, such as potato chips or pretzels. Maybe someone at my lunch table will trade with me, she thought. Will you trade snacks with me? Penny asked Jose. Nah, not today, Jose replied. Then she asked La Latika. Sorry, I don't have my glasses work, but <laughs> you, will you trade snacks with me? No, I like my lunch today. Sorry, Latika replied. <laughs> Philip, will you trade snacks with me? Penny asked. Sure, I will trade you my orange for your apple, he replied. Oh, I want to eat my apple. Mm -hmm. I want to trade my carrots, Penny said. Jonathan, will you trade me for my carrots, Penny asked. Yes, I have some peanut butter crackers, but I would rather have carrots. Let's trade. I can't eat peanuts. Thank you, though, Penny replied. <laughs> hey, why don't you just go buy something else? The cafeteria sells potato chips for 50 cents, Jose suggested. I would, but I don't have any money with me today, Penny said. I guess you have to keep trying to find someone to trade with you then, Latika suggested. Just then, Eduardo came to lunch and sat down. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. I was talking to Mrs. Best about chess club. What's going on, he asked. I forgot my money at home, so I'm trying to find someone who will trade with me. My carrots for something salty. It's not going well, Penny said. Well, you're in luck, Penny. I have potato chips, but I would rather have something healthier like carrots. I will trade with you, Eduardo replied. Penny's face got a big grin and she traded her carrots with Eduardo for his chips. Both were happy with their new items. Okay, so then in your text to text, when your kids are just pulling information directly from this story and comparing it to the last book you read, you can ask them, a salty snack for Penny is like one fine day because, so what's the connection between these two stories? 
you can tell me in the chat or if you're feeling real bold, you can come off mute. A salty snack for Penny is like one fine day because. I taught high school during the pandemic. I can outweigh you. <laughs> because oh, wait, Penny, needed, Penny needed something to be able to get what she wanted that she didn't have. Yeah, she has to barter to get the thing that she wants, right? And does she have any, I think so, there's more than one. I think also Penny doesn't have an easy time of it. Yeah, the character has, Penny has to approach many people just like the fox did, right? And so she's trading item for item. You'll notice in there that we did kind of head off this idea of like, well, you should just use money. Oh, well, I don't have any money. So you see how we pushed them back to bartering as a concept, even though, because your kids are savvy. They know that in the lunchroom they pay for their lunch, right? Okay, so um, we'll jump down to text to self. What I just read reminds me of the time when I used barter to blank. Right. And so this one is getting your kids to apply it to an outside situation, but one they've experienced. So this story reminds me of when I bartered for or to do blank. Right. And I asked you this question at the beginning, so I won't make you do it again. Right. But when you've bartered for something, getting them to apply it and transfer it into something they've experienced. OK. Text to world is number six. What I just read makes me think why we use money. It's easier to use money to trade because, and this one I do want you to either come off me or tell me in the chat. This is where you're going for kind of that longer transfer, right? Why is it easier to use money to trade? Anyone will take money. Exactly, right? And then later in some of your upper elementary standards, when we talk about what makes something good for money, that acceptability, something that people want is important. Right. But in this case, it solves two of our problems with bartering. It's faster and it's easier because you don't have to find people who have the items that you need or that you want to trade with the next person. You can just directly trade. Right. And get faster that item that you want. Remember, our essential question is why is trade helpful? Because it helps us to get things that we don't have. Right. OK, now. Let me turn this back over to Mary Claire and we're going to wrap it out because that's rough. That's basically the end of that lesson. It's relatively short. You can take the pieces apart and do it over a series of days or you can do it in one chunk if that's your preference. But all the components are there at that link we provided in the chat earlier. So let me turn this back over to Mary Claire to close us out. Yes, and really quickly, you know, for those who are secondary uh, teachers, you know, I think there's some application here, especially on the transfer side as a good reminder. Hey, how am I going to do transfer? You know, how can I use transfer in this text to text, text to self, text to world? It's a really easy way to sort of break down transfer. Um, I think it's really nice. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we have enough time, just quite enough time for this video, but um, we wanted to highlight it. You know, this is a standalone thing. It's not technically related with the lesson we just showed you, but I think it's a really nice example as we're thinking about, you know, demonstrating ways trade can be used to obtain goods and services. And so, um, oh, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, so what I would like to say would be that I think it's a lovely way to sort of reinforce the concept, right? So you've taught, you've taught it, and then you can come back to um, this concept, you know, into two or three days, right? This idea of that spaced repetition where you're, um, you know, you're having them doing retrieval practice for some of the concepts, but you're showing a different example. And so the perfect breakfast is um, a video that is basically, it's just showing, you know, two adorable kids, one in Florida, one in Canada and Florida, you know, what, what do we think they're selling in Florida? Orange Anyone juice. Want to guess? Yes, thank yes, you. Oranges, and then you know. what do we think? <laughs> What do we think the Canadians have to offer for the perfect breakfast? Syrup, syrup. or Canadian maple bacon. syrup? Maple syrup. <laughs> yes, Canadian, Ooh, Canadian, Canadian bacon. bacon. I didn't think of that one. That's a good one too. <laughs> yes, excellent. So you guys are predicting. Um, and so essentially it just 
draws out that relationship where, you know, there's a child in Florida who would love this perfect breakfast. They already have orange juice, but they would like maple syrup and, and, you know, vice versa in for this Canadian um, child. And then they show how those two regions are specializing in those two different things. And they come together to trade those two items with the result that we have the perfect breakfast. And so trade allows us to specialize. You know, it, it gets a little bit more um, detailed about that, but it, but it still is overall showing, you know, demonstrating ways trade can be used to obtain goods. So um, we think it's just a really nice example to use with your students. Um, and again, you know, engaging interactive short uh, and just a nice way to reinforce the concepts. And the other so thing about that, that, yes, sorry, and okay. just one thing, the other thing about that video too is that because it takes that idea that you've done with this barter and the fox and the other texts that you have, it gets kids to start thinking about, you know, the mm. trading everyday lives and that's a great opportunity for them to even like go to the grocery store and look at the fruits and the vegetables in the grocery section the produce section and they can see where their fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. come from at different times of the year so again it's just it just it's awesome it's a, great, it's a great gateway to allow students to continually transfer and apply those concepts um, and recognize them in their everyday beautifully yeah. said wonderful thank you <laughs> thank you for that ad um, and so with that, yes, but, you know, we, we are, um, we wanted to show you very quickly, you know, we have, um, as sort of alluded to, you know, we have a lot of different stories that we've found that have economic concepts, and we also have videos like that as well. Um, so we have videos that teach very short, simple concepts like scarcity, you know, et cetera. And then we also have these lessons that are tied to stories for that K to two audience. And so, um, you know, this QR code will get you there if you want to search. But the big thing would be um, you can filter by education level and we recommend you start there and just filter by that, you know, kindergarten or whatever age group you're at. Um, and then you'll start to see the age appropriate resources for you. And then finally, um, before, you know, we have been taking questions, hopefully, and hopefully you feel like you could, you know, you could ask questions. But, um, you know, if you want to uh, keep up with our stuff, feel free to join our newsletter. We just send resources related to, you know, your audience level um, and what what you would be interested in. So we're interested in getting resources to you that we think would be helpful, like that lesson plan. Um, and with that, I think we will say any questions. <laughs> this is here's our contact I think we can also type out our contact info in the chat if you ever want to reach out with additional questions about this lesson um, or any other questions you might have <laughs> 